Pediatric Behavioral Mental Health, Depression, produced by Pamela Chen, Magdalena Ivanova, Brenna Chase, and Caitlin Blackburn. Depression. Even though we became familiar with the diagnosis and treatment of depression in medical school, pediatric depression often remains stigmatized and undertreated. By the end of this video, our hope is that you will be able to describe the prevalence of pediatric depression in children and adolescents, apply the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, or AACAP, guidelines, the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP, guidelines, and DSM-5 criteria to screen for and diagnose patients with depression, initiate, titrate, and discontinue antidepressants for unipolar pediatric depression, and describe the common and serious adverse effects of antidepressants. Epidemiology Studies estimate that the risk for depression increases as we age. While only 2% of children between the ages of 6 and 11 years old report ever having depression, that number rises to 8 to 11% for those 12 to 17 years old. This prevalence varies by gender, however, with boys more commonly being diagnosed with depression than girls in childhood a difference that after puberty flips to mirror adult 2 to 1 female to male lifetime prevalence gender ratios. Children treated for major depression then typically have depressive episodes that last longer for 8 to 13 months compared to adolescents 4 to 9 months. For both age ranges, about half of these patients will experience a relapse or recurrence of their depression later on, with wide ranges in estimates between 20 to 70%. Multiple studies in the United States indicate that roughly 40% of children and adolescents with depressive disorders are not treated. Screening and Diagnosis As the prevalence of depression increases in adolescents and can have significant impacts on a child's health and well-being, the AACAP, the AAP, and the U.S. Preventative Task Force guidelines recommend universal annual screening for depression starting at 12 years. The AAP also recommends targeted screening starting at 10 years for patients with risk factors for depression, such as family history of psychiatric illness or substance use disorders, patients with significant psychosocial stressors such as trauma, abuse, neglect, or foster care, or patients with frequent somatic complaints. There are several screening tools for depression. The AACAP recommends the use of the Patient Health Questionnaire, Two-Item Survey, or PHQ-2, which simply asks, over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? Little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. This is scored with a zero to three point Likert scale ranging from not at all, several days, more than half the days, to nearly every day. One study found that a cutoff of 3 on the PHQ-2 is associated with the 74% sensitivity and 75% specificity for a diagnosis of depression. Other screening tools include the PHQ-9, which is modified for teens, the full 25-item strength and difficulties questionnaire, or the SDQ, and the short mood and feelings questionnaire. Ultimately, though, depression cannot be diagnosed through a screening form it requires thorough, careful evaluation. Depending on the presenting symptoms, along with the full history and physical exam, it may be important to send a CBC, chemistry, TSH, and or a urine tox screen. Pediatric unipolar major depression is then diagnosed using the same DSM-5 criteria as that used for adults. At least five of the following symptoms for two weeks, with at least one of those symptoms being depressed mood or anhedonia, with no history of mania or hypomania and symptoms not better explained by another medical condition. To quickly review our mnemonic, D-S-I-G-E-C-A-P-S. D stands for depression or irritable mood or dysphoria. S stands for sleep changes, hyper or insomnia. I stands for interest or pleasure loss in almost all activities, also known as anhedonia. G stands for guilt or worthlessness. E stands for energy loss or fatigue. C stands for concentration loss, impaired thinking, or indecisiveness. A stands for appetite or weight changes. And P stands for psychomotor agitation or retardation. And the second S stands for suicidal ideation or behavior. To receive a diagnosis, these symptoms must cause significant distress or functional impairment for the child 
which could be evidenced by declining academic participation and performance corroborated by the patient's teachers, interpersonal dysfunction with friends and family, and a spectrum of social-emotional reactions from children varying from clinging to others for constant reassurance, withdrawing socially or actively pushing others away, and making negative assumptions of others' intentions. For those with comorbid conditions such as ADHD, further difficulties with concentration must align with mood symptoms for that particular symptom to score on the DSM-5. Additionally, it is important to note any particular stressors or triggers for the patient's current depressive episode for optimal treatment, while realizing that the presence of a stressor, even bereavement, does not mean this is an adjustment disorder with depressed features or a grief response rather than depression if the symptoms are severe enough, as described above. Treatment Successful treatment requires collaboration with patients and their families and should occur in the least restrictive setting depending on the severity of illness and any safety concerns. Initial treatment with a combination of pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy has been shown to be more effective than either approach alone. By promoting coping skills and adaptive behaviors, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular has been shown to be widely efficacious among adolescents with depression and is an important adjunct to pharmacotherapy. Prior to starting pharmacological treatment, it is important to discuss the medication's indications, risks, benefits, side effects, and the expected lag of therapeutic onset. This can help to establish a therapeutic relationship, set expectations, and decrease the risk of discontinuation of therapy. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are the most commonly used antidepressants in children. There are currently only two FDA-approved SSRIs for pediatrics, fluoxetine, or Prozac, for ages 8 and above, and escitalopram, or Lexapro, for ages 12 and above. The first line of treatment for children and adolescents with depression is fluoxetine. Sertraline, escitalopram, citalopram, and venlafaxine are reasonable second-line agents for patients that do not respond to fluoxetine. Paroxetine is generally not used as it has not demonstrated efficacy in the pediatric population. In adolescents, we start fluoxetine at 10 mg per day for one week and titrate up to a target dose of 20 mg per day. If there is inadequate response after three weeks and the drug is tolerated, the dose can be increased to 40 mg per day. In children, we initiate fluoxetine at 5 mg per day and titrate up to a target dose of 10 mg per day. If response is insufficient after three weeks, the dose can be increased to 20 mg per day. Please refer to the chart for the starting dose and target dose of other SSRI options. After initiation of pharmacotherapy, patients should be monitored weekly for the first month, bi-weekly for the next month, and then monthly. During follow-up visits, it is important to assess for symptomatic improvement, side effects, and satisfaction with treatment. Adverse effects typically occur within days to weeks of starting a medication or increasing the dose. As most adverse side effects of antidepressants are most severe in the early treatment while their benefits are appreciated later on, it is common for many families to discontinue medications before they have an adequate chance to work. Thus, it is important to provide families with information regarding side effects and their expected time course. Common side effects of SSRIs include sleep changes, such as insomnia or sedation, GI upset, such as abdominal pain, nausea, and diarrhea, sexual dysfunction, and restlessness. It is also important to be aware of and monitor for the more serious adverse effects of SSRIs. One potential serious side effect of SSRI use is serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is a potentially life-threatening condition caused by overstimulation of serotonin receptors, leading to agitation, delirium, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypertension, muscle rigidity, and hyperreflexia. In severe cases, it can lead to seizures, arrhythmias, and death. While still possible, the risk of serotonin syndrome is low when using a single serotonergic drug. The risk increases with the use of other serotonergic medications, including other antidepressants, tryptans, and dextromethorphan, a cough suppressant. Another risk of SSRI use is suicidality. The FDA issued a black box warning regarding the risk of increased suicidality when starting antidepressants in children and adolescents. 
When considering the use of antidepressants, the risk of antidepressant-related suicide must be considered alongside the risk of suicide associated with untreated depression. After the black box warning was issued, the decline in antidepressant prescriptions in children was accompanied by a 14% increase in adolescent suicide rates. Furthermore, data from multiple trials suggest a number needed to treat of 3 to 6 for efficacy, compared to a number needed to harm of 143. With this data in mind, the consensus among most mental health specialists is that the benefits of antidepressants outweigh the risks. Typically, 70 to 80% of patients show a response to treatment. If a patient does not respond to treatment despite therapeutic dosing, then it is important to reassess the diagnosis, evaluate for comorbid conditions such as a substance use disorder, and assess for additional stressors and side effects that may be impeding adherence. Once these factors have been addressed, a reasonable strategy is to change to a different antidepressant and add psychotherapy if the patient is not already attending. Now that we have talked about treatment options and monitoring, let's discuss a common question that patients have. How long should treatment continue? Treatment of pediatric depression can be divided into an acute phase and maintenance phase. The acute phase aims to induce remission of symptoms and typically lasts 6 to 12 weeks. The goal of the maintenance phase is to prevent relapse and typically lasts 16 to 20 weeks, although the length is variable depending on the severity of illness, family preference, and number of previous relapses. In general, antidepressant therapy is recommended for one year after a first episode of depression, two years after a second episode, and indefinitely for those with three or more episodes. Discontinuation of antidepressant therapy should be performed slowly and with close monitoring. An exception to this rule is fluoxetine. Fluoxetine has a long half-life and can be discontinued abruptly without adverse effects. Other medications with short half-lives should be tapered before discontinuation. A typical taper schedule includes decreasing the dose by 25-50% to 50 per week. This wraps up our brief introduction to the epidemiology, diagnosis, and treatment of pediatric depression. As a quick review, the key learning points from this video are as follows. The prevalence of depression increases with age, with about 10% of adolescents reporting a history of depression. The AACAP and AAP recommend universal screening for depression with the PHQ-2 starting at age 12. The DSM-5 criteria for diagnosing depression is similar for all age groups. One important difference is that in children and adolescents, but not adults, persistent, irritable mood can count as a criterion. Combination treatment with pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy is the most effective. Prior to starting pharmacological treatment, it is important to discuss the medication's benefits, indications, risks, side effects, and the expected lag of therapeutic onset. Fluoxetine is the first-line pharmacological option. Patients should be monitored on a weekly basis for the first month after initiating therapy. An adequate trial of antidepressants is 6 to 12 weeks, followed by a maintenance phase of at least 16 to 20 weeks. Except for fluoxetine, most antidepressants should be slowly tapered down to avoid withdrawal symptoms. Hopefully, this video has been helpful to you. We hope you come away with a better understanding of depression in pediatric patients and feel equipped to identify symptoms, use tools to make the diagnosis, and initiate treatment management with families.